Hello and welcome to the first annual, or the, or the first, not first annual, the first online user group meeting here at Vectric. Um, what a day it's been. We started here at 11 o'clock this morning and as you can see outside, it's starting to get dark out already because it's 7 p.m. here. Um, if you've had a chance to take in any of the previous presentations, there's been five ahead of mine, all really great content. Um, if you haven't got a chance to catch them, they're going to be here available for you to watch at your leisure whenever you'd like to. I don't want you to go right now because I want you to hang around for this one. Um, just before us, just before me, excuse me, you would have seen JD from Rainfall Rainfall Projects, excuse me, and Sammy from Avid CNC, and they went through three of his projects. The one that really caught my eye was the Hurley that he gave away for his groomsmen, it really beats the heck out of a pocket knife, I think, in the end. I would much rather have had a Hurley. That would have been great. Uh, one of the great things about that is that he showed you some great techniques on doing some 3D modeling when he did his Hurley. And some of those things we're going to touch on again in the third part of my presentation. So if you caught that one, it was a great primer for what you're going to see here. A little bit of house cleaning before we get started. Obviously, I'm working from home. I have two kids and my wife. They're gonna, they told me they were gonna be super quiet, but we'll see how that goes. And right behind me, I have a train about two blocks over that goes by. I'm not quite sure when it's gonna go by, but it goes by whenever. And so if it does go by and it makes a lot of racket, then I will try and quiet down and pause what I'm doing and then pick up once it goes by. So I will do my best, do my best. Um, so. This video is more of a proof of concept to some ideas that I had with, regard, with, with regards to how you could use your hybrid CNC with your laser attached to it to do some things that would add a little bit of extra detail to your projects. Um, and so I'm gonna walk you through those. Because they're, they're proof of concepts, I don't really expect that you're gonna probably cut or even burn these files, but what I do think you might do is take away some great pointers so that when you do have to create your next project with your hybrid laser CNC. You've got some interesting ideas. Also, if you're on the fence about investing in a, in a laser for your CNC or even looking at the uh, laser module that we offer, this might actually push you over the edge, which would be kind of nice. Anyway, so let's get right into what we're gonna see today, okay? So as we know, there are all kinds of different ways to add the detail to your projects. And currently right now, the three that come to mind right off the bat I'm sure our V-carving, 3D modeling, and then of course finishing. V-carving we, we can do, you've got that feature in your software if you have V-carved Desktop or Pro or Aspire. 3D modeling of course with Aspire and then finishing well with Cut 2D all the way up through our range. You can, if you're good at finishing, then you can do all kinds of great things. But if you add to that the laser, then you can add etching or marking as one of your ways to get some extra detail into your projects, which I think is really kind of cool. So first of all, Ed this morning, Ed Powell, our managing director here at Vectric, when he did his introduction and in what's new video or presentation, excuse me, um, he went over the new laser module that we have. Now it's an add-on for our software and you can add that in to um, Cut2D Desktop, Cut2D Pro, into VCarve Desktop, VCarve Pro, or Aspire. Now, like I said, it's a purchasable thing. Now. If you want to give it a shot, then you can download one of our free trial versions. Even if you have one of these packages already installed and you want to give it a go, go download the trial version of the product that you want. Add in the laser module. It's all explained there on our page for us, and you can give it a shot with some of our free projects, okay? You can just go over and get that. Look at the products um, in our, or the, the free trials on our website. Um, also, what I'm going to be using today is going to be um, V-Transfer. Now, V-Transfer comes with all of our products again. And what it's used for is to send the G-code directly from your software right onto your CNC. So if you happen to have a CNC that plugs directly into your laptop that has a Gerbil or GRBL um, controller, then you can use V-Transfer to send your G-code right straight from the software, which is really quite powerful. And that's what I'm going to use for all three of these projects. Now, what you may have seen a while ago is this tiger face that we did. And earlier today, you saw Ed demonstrate a, a great way of using a laser to put a bitmap on top of a face that he profiled out or that he created a low relief for. And that's what I did here. We created a very low relief of a tiger's face and we used the bitmap that I'd used to make that model with to add some extra detail. And, and let me tell you, 
In the end, it looks better than I can ever show here. It is a really cool way of adding detail, especially when you're talking about hair and fur, colors. It's sometimes it's really hard to do that when you're 3D modeling or V-carving or adding any sort of finishing. So your laser is a great way to do that. So when I was coming up with my ideas for this particular presentation, like I said, I had three. And the first one we're gonna talk about is how to use your laser to get where your cutter has never gone before. So this video is going to be useful for anybody who has Cut2D de Cut Desktop Pro, VCarve Desktop, VCarve Pro, or Aspire. Okay, so now I'm going to refer to a V-bit. Of course, you can't use the V-bit in Cut2D, but it's only for demonstration purposes only. Um, but you can use this in what you're doing for sure. So you've probably all seen this um, tutorial that we have on our site. It's the rocket sign. And what we're showing here is how you can put texture in behind or in the background of a sign that has raised text and a raised border. Now you'll notice that around the edge of the border and also around the edge of the, uh, the text, there's a flat area at the base of it. And that's because the tool can't get quite up to the edge. So in my high quality image here that I put together for you, you can see exactly what I'm talking about. This is a representation of a V-bit or a bullnose end mill, whatever you want to think of. But in this case, you can see that there's a little bit of a triangle there of material that your V-bit can't get to. And if you do make it go into that area, then it's going to end up gouging your text or your border. So if you have a laser, you can get way closer. So I thought about that and I thought, well, let's see if we can do something fun and interesting with that. So let's hop into the software. So this here is Cut2D. And um, when you, or if you purchase the extras pack, you're gonna end up getting this file. And of course, with all of our files, you get this notes that pops up. This is really important always, but extra important here because we'll be using a laser. So make sure that you look at all the tool paths, make sure that they're safe and appropriate for your machine, make sure you're wearing the proper goggles and so on, or protection that you need when you use your laser. It's really super important. So we can just click OK and go right on past that. So let's have a quick look at the setup of this job. Like I said, this is a proof of concept. It's really not important, the job setup, but just so you know what I'm working with here, we'll take a look at my job setup. So it's a single-sided job. The width of it is 150 millimeters across. The height is about 55 millimeters. The thickness is 18 millimeters. That's the material we had kicking around that I used. We're going to zero off our material surface, and that's going to be important in a minute when I talk about zeroing your laser. Um, the datum set to the bottom left corner and because this is cut 2D we can't use any 3D components in there so you can't or you don't have the option to choose your modeling resolution so we'll just click OK and we'll go ahead so the first thing we're going to do is show you what happens when we first start the rocket demo so let's take a look at our tooling here we're going to tile our views first we'll bring up our tool pass tab we'll retile our views so we can see everything so in the rocket demo what we do is we take the text and we take an outside border and we go ahead and we pocket that out. Now we're using a smaller machine, a desktop CNC in this case, so it has a very small collet on it. So we're using small cutters for all three of these demonstrations. So the start depth on this is going to be right on the surface of our material. We're going to go down only two millimeters. Now we're using a laser, so really you can go down as far as you want as long as you're careful and you're being safe with your machine. In our case, we, have, we actually have the collet of our um, router there it's, it's right there so we need to be careful we don't go really too deep so two millimeters was perfect for this particular demonstration we're going to use a three millimeter end mill to pocket this out and we're going to use an offset tooling and we're just going to go ahead and rename that pocket and we'll just calculate that up real quick it's pretty easy and we'll preview that visible tool path and we'll take a close look at that so that looks really good Nice raised text, two millimeters deep in the background. Everything looks great. So what if we decided that we wanted to put a texture in the background, but just not a texture? How about maybe a drop shadow? We can use our laser to create a really cool drop shadow effect, or at least I think we can. So let's give it a shot. So let's tile our views again, and let's take a look at our 2D view. Actually, we're going to make our 2D view full screen. Press F on the keyboard to get everything right in the center, and we'll close down our toolpath stuff. We don't need that right now. So to do this drop shadow, the first thing we need to do is we need to copy our text. So let's just go ahead and right click on our text once we have it selected. 
and we are going to copy that to a layer. It's going to be a brand new layer. I'm going to give it a name. We'll call it Shadow Line. Sure, that works. And we're going to give it a color of maybe orange. That's great. And we're going to make that our new active layer. Okay, so it'll be a selected when we're done doing this. And we can click OK. Now, if I off click, you'll see that I have speed, a copy of the speed text, and it's orange and it sits directly on top of the black text, which is fine. Now, what we're going to do is I'm going to select that text and we're going to use the distort selected objects. Now, I don't, we don't show this off very often, but in all of our products, we have the option of doing that with 2D stuff. And if you happen to have a spire, then you can distort 3D objects with this particular tool. So we can use the bounding box to distort it. We can run, or can distort it along a single line, or we can distort it between two lines. So in this case, we're just gonna use the bounding box because really that's all we need. So we're gonna hit apply, and we are gonna select these top two nodes. Now just using the cursor keys on my keyboard, I'm just gonna position that back here. Now what I'm trying to do is balance off the distance between here, the S in the border, and then over here and the D in the border. And so we'll just go ahead and do that. Now I'm looking for a couple things. One, because I've done this twice now, I cut a prototype, and then I also have the, the final one. I know a couple of little tricks or things I'm gonna look out for. One is that I wanna make sure that the tops of my E's don't actually lie lay on top of any of the other parts of the E, the vectors especially. I don't want my burn line to run up along there. Um, I can edit that out later, but I'm just gonna save myself the hassle. So I'm gonna go just inside of that. That looks really good. And I think that's really all I'm gonna look out for. And I'm gonna bake that distortion in there because I wanna keep it that way. I'm not gonna edit it later. Let's bake that in. And then when I bake it, I need to make sure that I right click on that and I choose to go ahead and group those together. Make sure you do that because if not, they're actually broken apart. So you have to go in and select all those bits and then group it. If you do it now, you're gonna save yourself some trouble. So let's close that down. And now the next thing we're gonna do is just nudge that speed text, the orange stuff up just a little bit so that the S is inside. So this little belly of this S here is inside of the other one. Again, it'll just save us a little cleanup in the end. And that looks really good. Now we're gonna need some lines to use to create this drop shadow. So we're gonna make sure that we have toggle smart snapping turned on. We'll just zoom out a little bit. And we're gonna drop in a line from one end to the other, making sure that it's long enough that it peaks out both ends of the orange speed. So it has to be longer, as long as the speed, if not a little bit longer. And then we're just gonna press escape and we are gonna use our cursor keys and nudge that up into place. Now also what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna right click on that and I'm gonna move it onto its own layer. So we're going to uh, move to a layer, it's gonna be a new layer and we'll call these, how about lines? That works, call it lines. And we'll give it a color green and we're gonna go okay. We off click, you'll see that now it's on its own layer. We can select that. We're gonna make sure that we choose the lines up here. Okay, make sure that's selected so that what it, so that the next resulting function that we're gonna do, all those vectors will show up on that appropriate layer. So now we're gonna go ahead and use the array copy. And this will quickly allow us to make a series of lines at a certain distance apart. So let's click that. And we have to make sure we have that vector selected. You'll see it tells us the object length. That's not so important because visually we know it's, a, it's, no, it's long enough. We're gonna make 15 rows and one column. The gap is gonna be a, um, in between the actual uh, line. So it's gonna be a one millimeter gap. And really that doesn't matter so much because we're gonna take it and we're gonna stretch it to fit. We're gonna make sure that we don't have any symmetry turned on, doesn't really matter. And we don't need any row or column displacement. And we're gonna make sure that we group those vectors together. And we're just gonna say copy. And there we have it. We can close that down and then we can select that. Now it's already grouped together. So all we need to do now is just stretch that up a little bit and make sure that top line is just inside of the top of that E. And I want that because in a minute when we trim these vectors, I want that top one to stay around. I want to keep that one. So let's just zoom out now and scroll over a bit. Now what we're going to do is we're going to trim this. So the idea with the drop shadow is we only want to keep the bit that's inside the orange speed text, and we want to remove the, the stuff that's going to run over top of the black speed text. We don't want it to burn on top of those letters. That's easily done. With our series of vectors selected, we're gonna hold down my shift key and we're gonna grab the orange speed. 
And then we are going to click on Trim Vectors. Select that, and we are going to clear outside of the boundary. We're just going to clear that. We got it made. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to select the black speed text, and we're going to do the opposite, and we're going to clear inside those. And we'll clear that. And there we go. That's that. We can close that down. Now, if we want to get a sense of what this is going to look like in the end, let's just hide our tool pass tab for a second. We can just go ahead and hide the orange text. And there we have what we're going to end up with in the end. Now, a few caveats to this. If we go ahead and bring back up our tooling again and we turn on our tool path, we make a solid preview, you're going to see that your tool is not going to get into that nice sharp point there. So you'll see that part of this line is going to burn up onto the face of your text. To fix that, there's a couple different methods. You could use the fillet tool if you want to and fillet all those beforehand. You can do the old offset out, offset in thing that we do all the time. You could do that as well. Or what you can do, just click it. And because I forgot to regroup them, we can go into node mode and we can just grab that and move that vector out of the way. And that's probably the only one we need to worry about. There are a couple little ones down here that we are actually going to get rid of. Delete those out of there. That's perfect. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I messed up there, didn't I? Okay. Let's just go ahead and move this back to its speed text where it needs to be. Oh, we got ungrouped them all on me. Look at that. Okay. As always do in this live, these are the things that you get into, right? Let's move those back to the speed layer where they belong. And there we have it. Oh, I forgot one more. Look at that. Now, if I want to select all of the green vectors, what I can do is go up to my Layers Manager here, right-click on Lines, and go Select Vectors, and they're all selected now, so we can see that. Now, I think I've pretty much... Oh, shoot. Boys, oh, boys, I haven't got enough coffee in me, apparently. We'll right-click on those, and we're going to group those together once I have them selected. That's what I meant to do. Okay, so let's just go ahead now and laser those in there, okay? Let's put this away. We don't want that anymore. We don't need to hide that. And we are going to use, because we have the laser module installed, the laser cut and fill. So let's select that. The laser that we're going to use is a 6-watt laser. It's already selected for me. We're going to use a power of 75%. Move speed is 30, which is perfect for what I'm doing. Number of passes is going to be 1. We're going to cut on those lines. We are going to rename that just cut or laser cut. Now, like I said before, because we have the transfer installed, I could send these right off to my machine right away and do it right now, but I'm not going to. I'm actually going to calculate those and preview those in the 3D view to see what we're going to end up getting. And that's the end result. Now, you'll do it smoother than that because you want to made all those little errors along the way, but this is kind of neat in the end. I think you can see the potential of this right there. Now, let's have a look at the actual cutting that happened in the labs with this. So here I am getting started. I'm zeroing out my, uh, my end mill to do the first of the pockets. And that's V transfer in action. Sent that right off to the machine and off we go to pocket this out. Using some really inexpensive off the shelf pine here. It is a little fuzzy, maybe because of the, the quality of the wood or maybe my cutter wasn't quite sharp enough. You notice here that the middles of the D and the P haven't been cut out. They get cut out at the end of the toolpath, which was kind of interesting the way it calculated things. And here I go, just sanding off the face, making sure not to hit my finger on that bit there. And here we go, and we are going to do the offset for the laser. Offset that, and off we go, and we're going to laser that now. What I had to do, because I'm zeroing off the surface of my material, I actually had to zero the Z height of my laser and then drop it down two millimeters. That way the focus would be the proper distance away from the material surface that I was going to etch. So that's really, really important to remember to do that. In the end, this went really fast and it looked pretty neat in the end. There we have it. You'll see a couple times there I should have edited my vectors a bit because it did roll up onto the surface of the speed text, but that was easily sanded off in the end. I didn't have to worry about that too much. And then we, we ran this profile cut to cut it out. And off we go. And there it is in the end. And then the next shot you're going to see it with a little bit of clear coat on there, and that looks pretty cool. 
So I hope you, you kind of thought that was an interesting use of your laser to give yourself some texture or some details in the background of a sign like that. I think that's pretty cool. So the next little demonstration I'm gonna do here is sometimes your laser can stand in for V carving or can actually replace it a little bit if you would like to. So this demonstration again is gonna be geared towards V carve desktop pro and aspire users. In saying that though, you can use the same idea with cut 2D if you would like to with two and a half D stuff, you can use your laser to do some of these neat things too. So don't discount yourself out of this one if you have cut 2D. So V carving is great, it's fantastic. But if you've got a material that's really thin, then sometimes if your font or the graphic that you're trying to V carve, if it's extra wide, then there's a good chance that your V carve bit might actually go right through your material. Now, of course, the dev team has thought about that, and we have this great feature about using the flat or the flat bottom option, which is really quite nice. Works pretty good, but maybe it's not exactly the look that you're looking for. So that's where we can jump in with the with a 3D or a fast 3D carving, excuse me, and some lasering on top of that. So let's have a look at that inside the software. So here we've got the VCarb desktop. And this file, of course, again, when you open it up, make sure that everything is set safe and appropriate for your machine. And again, we're using lasers, so it's really important that you have all the protection that you need put in place. So we're going to click OK. Now let's for a minute pretend that this happens to be a ringette team or an ice hockey team, and they're getting their uh, team photo taken. They like to have a nice little wooden plaque for the bottom of their team photo, and this happens to be their logo. And at first, they, we thought that V-carving would be a great option. So let's have a look at that and see how V-carving is going to work with this. If we take a look at our material setup, it's 150 millimeters across by 35 millimeters tall. The material is only 5.5 millimeters thick, so it's not very thick. We're going to zero off our top of our material, of course, the datum set to the very bottom left. We need to make sure our modeling resolution is set to very high because we will be using a piece of 3D clip art in here and we are going to change the appearance to be Canadian maple. That's right, this is a hockey plaque after all. So we're going to go OK and that's great. So let's quickly just go ahead and pop up our toolpaths tab. Let's have a look at our 3D view and 2D view together. We're going to select both of these sets of vectors, so the text and the star, and we're gonna quickly V-carve this. So the start depth is gonna be zero. We're gonna have no flat depth this time around. Let us, we're just gonna let it do its thing. We're gonna use a very small engraving cutter because again, this machine has a small collet on it or a good size collet for the machine. It's only got a three millimeter collet on it. So we're gonna use this small engraving cutter and we are just gonna go ahead and V-carve that as a test. We'll calculate that up real quick. And right away, the software is going to tell us you're going to cut through your material. And that's okay, because we want to see what that's going to look like. Let's preview that visible toolpath. And you'll see there's some blue showing through that star. If we maximize that, you'll see that that's not exactly what we wanted to have happen and really wouldn't look all that great in the end. So let's go ahead and recalculate that toolpath with a flat bottom. Let's make that a two millimeter flat bottom. That means we are actually going to have three and a half millimeters of extra material behind that. Let's just go ahead and recalculate that. Let's reset our preview and let's preview that toolpath and see what we get. Again, looks really good. That's a nice idea, but it's not exactly what I want to see. It looks good and there's nothing wrong with this. It would be perfect, but maybe we can do something a little bit different with a one little piece of 3D clip art and some neat laser stuff. So let's close this down and let's go and tile our views. And we're going to go back into this toolpath again and we're going to unselect the star. We're going to let it just do its thing. We don't want to give it a flat depth and we'll go ahead and calculate that and we'll call this V-carving text now, and we'll calculate that. Reset our preview, and we'll preview our visible toolpath. It looks great, just what we wanted. Okay, so the next step is we'll maximize our 2D view, press F on the keyboard to make sure we can see everything. Actually, we can close down our toolpath tab. We won't need that for a second. Let's just press F again. Let's go to our, our clip art tab, and we're gonna go into our design and make clip art for a second. 
And I know that down here at the very bottom of our clip art in the Western Saloon number two project, we have a star. Very basic 3D star, nothing fancy about that. We'll double click on it and we'll bring it into our job. And we're just gonna size that down to the approximate size that the star is here. It's pretty easy to do. Just kind of get it in there. Maybe a little bit smaller. That's good. We'll just use our cursor keys and nudge that up and then we'll get rid of that old vector. We don't need that anymore. And let's have a look at our 3D view again. So here we have our star. But the problem is this is a positive star and we're trying to do something with sort of V-carving-ish. So let's go to our modeling tab. We're going to right click on the star and we're going to choose combine mode is going to be subtract now. So now it's a recessed star and you can see that in the 3D view. Now as a top tip here, just a little bit of safety, we're going to want to make sure that we throw in a zero plane there. That way if, if our tool happens to roll off the edge of that, it's not going to leave any weird divots or anything like that. But it's always a good practice to have that in there anyway. Let's zoom into our star and we are going to need to um, draw some lines in here. So what we're going to do is select that. It's already selected. We're going to choose to create a vector from this 3D component. And then we are going to go to our drawing tab and we are going to draw in some triangles in there. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm just going to snap here to the center and here. And top tip is if we want to finish this off with a line, we can just press tab on our keyboard and now it's a finished shape. So we can do that all across here. Press tab again. This one down here, tab. This one here, tab. And this one here. And we'll tab that. So we'll close that down. And now we have all these little segments that we can use in a second. And that's perfect. So now let's just go ahead now and, and cut this. So what we're going to do, bring back up our tool pass tab again, and we'll take a look at this. We're going to choose this outline vector that we used, or that we made with our star, and we are going to choose to do a quick finishing pass. We're not going to bother with a roughing pass. This is only about one millimeter deep. There's not a whole lot of relief here. So if we use a ball nose end mill, and a big one in this case, a three mil ball nose, remember it's a three mil collet, so that's as big as we can get with that particular thing or at least for what we had in the labs. We're gonna use that selected vector. We're gonna use a raster toolpath, no boundary offset at all. And we're just gonna call this 3D finish and we're gonna calculate that. And let's preview that visible toolpath. That's perfect, it's exactly what we want. Just something very rough. It's gonna look good in the end, I promise. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna close this down and we're gonna select all three of those, or all, excuse me, all five of those Stars, stars, things, triangles we built. We're going to go into the same laser cut and fill, same 6 watt laser that we have, power 75%, same settings as before. We're going to use a hatch fill though instead this time. The step over is going to be 0.5 of a millimeter. That was the number that was there to begin with and it looked good. I didn't mess around with it any. Of course, if you think it needs to be more dense or more sparse, the actual um, step over, then you can go ahead and adjust that to your liking. But I thought it looked pretty good. We're going to make sure that we project that onto the 3D model. We need that because we want it to follow the contours or the shape of that star. And we're just going to call that laser cut. And we're going to go ahead and calculate that. Then we'll preview that visible toolpath. And that's a zoom out, make that maximum, and take a peek at that. Now for me, that looks pretty neat. That subtle sort of 3D model that we used with the, with the big ball nose end mill was really quick to cut, and we added a bit of laser to give us that shading that we needed. So let's have a look at what that looked like when we went and cut it in the labs. So here I am setting up the machine again, putting in the engraving bit, and using V-Transfer to send that over to the CNC. Now this little cutter does a really nice job. Nice and clean and crisp. Um, this is walnut, I believe, and uh, it looked really good in the end. There wasn't a whole lot of fuzzies left over for me to deal with. Just a quick little sanding, and that was great, and off we went. This was pretty quick in the end, actually. Really fast. 
And yeah, there we go, that's it. Now the next thing we're gonna do is we put in that three millimeter ball nose end mill. This went really fast. Actually, Anthony, our, our video guy, he, he had to shuffle around really quick to get this shot because it was done before we knew it. It was really fast. And a nice use of V-curve, or of a 3D model and a big bit. Now we're gonna go ahead and add in our offsets. What this does is it moves the CNC in position so we can use our laser. And off we went. And this again was really quite fast. Now that offset is determined by your actual laser setup that you have. You can figure that out when you first get it. That looks pretty neat in the end. So after this, we ended up running a profile cut so we could get it out of the material. And I was very, very careful when I pulled this off of the machine. We used some really good double-sided tape and I didn't want to break it in half. Did a little bit of edge sanding to that. It looks really good. And you'll see that the, the slight contrast between that 3D model looks really good in there. It makes it light and dark and everything came out really nice in the end. I think you'd agree that that's a really neat option to offer people if the V-carving option won't work and if you have the hybrid laser setup. So this last demonstration, this is number three in the demo and I think I'm doing good for time, so that's great. Um, it's only for Aspire because we're actually gonna do some modeling. Now don't discount this if you have V-carve Desktop or Pro, if you already have some pre-made clip art, then you can, you can do this as well. You might be able to use this, this idea in that and also with um, Cut2D Pro and Desktop, the same thing, even though you're going to only do two and a half, you're limited to two and a half D carving, then you can still use this idea if, if you have a laser on your machine to add in some interesting detail. So adding detail is really hard to do in low relief. Um, you can model it in like we talked before, but sometimes it's just not quite enough, especially when it comes to modeling hair and texture. And especially if you want to add in some lighting and shadows, it's really hard to kind of get those right, the right balance and how it all kind of works in the end. But with your laser, you can get this done really easy and it looks really nice. So I'm going to show you a neat stylized way of creating some shadows on some mountains. And we're going to start with just some vectors to do this with. So let's pop into Aspire. Again, we've got our warning up here. It's really important that you check the tooling if you decide to use these files. And if you're going to use your laser, make sure that you have all the proper safety gear on. Okay, we want you to be very safe. So we're going to click OK. Let's have a quick look at the job setup here. Again, it's a single sided job. All these have been so far. The width of this is 160 millimeters across. The height is 85 millimeters. It's quite a big piece for a very low relief. And it's going to be cut into a piece of material that's 20 millimeters thick. It's a nice white light piece of oak, which looks really nice. And we're going to zero off the surface of our machine. Datum's in the bottom left. Again, we're creating a 3D model, so you're going to, we're going to want to have it set to very high, your modeling resolution. And I'm going to change this to be okay, maple again. Okay, we're going to click OK at the bottom. Let's have a look at what we have here for layers. There is two layers. We have the modeling vectors that we're going to use to create the low relief. And then we also have a shading level that we'll look at in our layer, excuse me, and we'll look at that in a few minutes. Now, as JD showed you earlier in the previous demonstration, um, a little bit about the two rail sweep, we're going to do the same thing here. So the way this file is set up is there's a bunch of open line segments, and these define the rails that we're going to use to extrude this cross section along to build ourselves this mountain range. Um, let's go into our modeling tab and we're going to be using this guy right here, create a shape by sweeping between two vectors. And again, like JD showed you, did a great job. We're going to need to first of all start by choosing two vectors. Now, what I've done here is I've set this up in the way that I would create a mountain range, okay? So you'll see we've got some vectors that are kind of out on their own. These three will make up one mountain. And the next mountain, I have these two vectors. This one is slightly offset inside. I've planned ahead for that. I didn't want to have to nudge over a component into place. I'm going to build it right in place where it needs to be. Rule of thumb is spend some time making good vectors. You're going to spend less time modeling. 
So we're going to hit or hold down our shift key and we're going to grab these two vectors and we're going to use selection. Now, this is set up, we're always going, when we build this mountain, this one section of mountain, we're going to share this middle vector. And so when we choose vectors, you're going to see some important things. There are, there are arrows on that telling you which way the vectors are pointing. And also there are their colors, the red and the green, like JD had shown you. The red one, we are going to hang, is the, is the, the start side, we can call it that. We're going to hang this vector off of this, starting with this end. So it's going to extrude that cross-section up there along these two, or between these two vectors. Okay, that's important because we want the mountain to look like this in the end. So we're going to use, oh, I've already chosen my selection. We're going to make sure we cho choose our cross-section. And we have some options about what we're going to do with this cross-section. It's important when we're modeling this that we do not select scale cross-section with width. If it was selected, what would happen is as we, we extrude that along this those two those two lines the z height will actually change and we don't want it to change it needs to stay say stay wow the same height so that both sides of this mountain marry up perfectly in the middle and we're going to deal with the weirdness that happens at the end in a little bit we're going to make sure that we have sweep between spans we don't need to make sure it is i'm going to have it turned on it really only matters if you're using two different cross sections but we're going to leave it on because we only have one that doesn't change anything and we are going to go ahead and make sure we don't scale it to exact height. We're going to merge this in place. And I'm not going to change the component name. It doesn't matter because there's going to be a few of them here. And it's going to be left side of a mountain, right side of a mountain. It doesn't make any sense. We're just going to leave it as it is. And we are going to click apply. And then we're going to take a look at what we have. And here's what we have. And that looks okay. Now you will see there's a little, some strange lines across here. There's a quick deviation here in the profile of this vector compared to this. So you get that little dive in and then reduction at that end of the actual vector. What we can do to minimize that is just to position this vector somewhere it's different in that extrude. So let's just go ahead and drop that in here. And we can kind of make it look a little bit more natural by dropping a couple of those in there. And then we can reapply that, and you'll see in the 3D view that fixes that a little bit and looks a little nicer. So instead of closing down this dialog here, we're going to save us a few clicks, and we're just going to choose Start a New Component. And we can go ahead and keep moving across our mountain range. Let's choose this outside vector first, an inside vector, select those. And again, like I said, we're going to hang this vector off the red line. And so this end is going to be hung off this side and it's going to be extruded with the tall end over here. If we make sure that we don't choose that scale cross section with width and we choose our cross section, hit apply, you'll see what happens in our 3D view. Everything lines up perfectly like it should, except for, like I had mentioned, this bit of weirdness at the end. But I promise you, we will fix that. Start our next component and we're going to move along. This one here, the way I sort of see this part of the mountain is that it's actually an independent mountain sitting in behind this one. So if I go ahead and select this vector first and then this vector, use that selection and then grab my cross section and apply that. I'm going to get what I want, but what I wanted, what I will later on is I'm going to deal with this high edge that we have here. I'm not going to worry about that right now. And we're going to move on to this next section. I'm going to grab this vector and this vector Use that selection, zoom out a little bit, grab that cross section, we'll apply that. It's remembered all of these settings, so I don't need to bother to go back and look them all over again. Start a new component. Let's go ahead and select these two again. Use that selection. Go back over here, grab that cross section. Apply that. Got our other side of our mountain over here. Same weirdness at the top. We're not going to worry about that. Start a new component. And we're going to deal with this one the same way we dealt with the other sort of fragmented mountain there. Grab those two vectors. We'll use selection. Go back over here. Grab that cross section. Apply that. And now that we're all done that, we can go ahead and close that down and maximize our 3D view. And this is what we have. If we look straight down on it, it actually does look like a mountain range, I think, in the end. But as we rotate it around, we have some issues. So let's fix those. First one we're going to deal with is this mountain here on the left. We're going to select both of those pieces and we're going to bake those together into one component. So we're going to choose bake 
And you'll see down here that two components now become one, and we can use that the way it is. We're going to do the same with this guy over here. We'll bake those together. So seven components now becomes five, which is a little easier to work with. And there we have that. Now, to take care of this weird thing at the top, we're going to select that. And then we're going to click it again, and we're going to choose to use our floating properties dialog. Now we can get to these same options over here if we want to, but we need to apply these in our 2D view. I want to do all of this in the 3D view, so I'm going to use this floating properties dialog here that I accessed from the 3D view. Not going to worry about the shape height here at all. We're going to deal with that in the end once we get everything done. We just want to make it visually right, and then we'll scale it properly in the end. So we're going to fade this. The, fade, the way fade works is we're going to choose two anchor points and we're going to fade between those two anchor points. So we're going to set those one down here at the bottom and one at the very tippy top up here. And by default, it's going to fade at 50%. We're going to make sure that we fade all the way to 100%. And now you'll see the top of that mountain has been dealt with now. It looks really cool. Let's look down at it again. And let's do the same with this mountain over here. As soon as I select that, you'll see that the options in here pertain to that new component that I have selected. So we can just go ahead and fade this one from the bottom to the top. We're going to make that 100%. Press the spacebar, and that's perfect. The next one we're going to want to deal with is going to be this fella right here. Okay, let's look down at that. Now I'm going to fade it the same way, because what I see this in my head, like I said, it's another mountain in behind this. So the peak should be farther away than the front. So let's grab that or select that component, not grab it, and we're going to fade that, we'll set those two anchor points, one at the bottom again, one just above the top, and we're going to fade that again to 100%, press the space bar, and that looks great. Don't worry, we're going to deal with this in the end in a second, we're just going to make sure we have everything else all worked out. Let's do the same with this guy, we're going to fade that, we'll set that here from there to there, Make that 100%, press the space bar, and we have that all ready to go. Now, how are we gonna deal with this little edge right here? Well, again, like I'd said, I feel that this peak here is off in the distance farther. So I'm gonna take this mountain and I'm gonna tilt it up a little bit so that I can get this end of this mountain down here to marry up with this spot right here on my bottom of my mountain that's in the background. So to do that, we're gonna zoom out just a little bit and we're gonna go ahead and tilt that like so, from here to there. And we're gonna make that 1.55. We're just gonna guess at an angle. Oh, that was almost exactly right. So we'll make this 1.6 spacebar, and that's good to go. Looks great, and we're gonna do the same with this one here. Except for this one, where when we add in our tilt, we're gonna make sure that we set our anchor point way over here where the green is, because that's our full component. I'm gonna click on this side of that, way over here to there, do the same thing. We'll make this 1.55. I'm just guessing at this, by the way. It's not quite enough. You can see that it's not quite exactly what I want. We've got 7.5. Still not enough. Let's go whole hog here and do 2% and get that up there. And that looks great. I'm really happy with that. The only thing that I think it looks a little funny is right here where these two mountains come together. There's a bit of a dip there. To fix that, we can do that easily by tilting this guy just a little bit from here over to here, and we'll do that by 1%, and we'll fix that little bit in the middle. So we're going to reset our anchor points here again. I was off just a little bit, it fixes that right up, and we'll make that 1.25 spacebar. And that looks great, perfect, those marry up perfectly where I want them to be, and that's great. Now, the next thing we do, we need to make this look like it belongs all together. So we are going to make a brand new level over here. And we are going to choose, once we have this selected, we're going to choose to create a component from what we see in the 3D view. I'm going to select that, and you'll see that now we have copy a visible model, unselect all the bits that we need to make that. And that looks really great. Now, before we go any farther, I'm going to need an outline of this in a minute. So I'm going to save myself a little bit of grief and I'm going to go to my 2D view with that object selected. I'm going to choose to create a vector outline from that selected component. Okay, so I have now have an outline that I'm going to use a bit later. 
Let's go back to our 3D view for a second. Let's grab this component. And now we need to smooth it. We're going to choose our Apply Smoothing Filter. We're just going to go crazy with it. We're going to turn it up all the way. And we're going to click OK. And that's perfect. That's all we need to do. Next step is going to be, like I had said, we need to take a look and see how thick this is. This is going to be a low relief. I don't want it any more than 2 millimeters thick. It is nearly 3.5, so we're going to make this 2.5. Press the space bar and we'll close that down. Now in the software, that looks like it's a good looking relief. In real life, if you cut this into a light piece of material, it wouldn't look nearly as reliefy as that. So let's go ahead and have a look at what we can do about that. If we bring up our shading vectors here, you see I've pre-drawn some nice looking vectors here that we can shade in these mountains with. To do that, we're gonna need some vectors and the best way to do that is gonna be to draw in some vectors over here, just some straight lines is all we need. Press escape on that, nudge that over. We're going to right click on that and we're going to move that to a brand new layer and we're going to call this, you guessed it, lines. And we're going to change the color of that to be orange and we'll click, oh, make, make it active layer and we're going to click that. We're going to do the same thing we did before and we are going to choose the array copy except for we're going to make one column and a hundred rows Again, 100, 100 is because I want them to be decently dense. So that works out okay for me. One millimeter gap, and we're gonna group our copies. And we're gonna go okay, copy that. This thing is all grouped together. We can just select that, and we can stretch that out to the edge there. I wanna make sure that they get inside that last bit. We're gonna use the same thing we did a minute ago with the other demonstration. We are gonna keep those lines selected we're gonna select or shift select the shading areas here that I've done. We're gonna use our trim tool and we're gonna trim outside and we'll clear that and close that down. Now to get an idea of what, I did it again. I, I didn't group those. So let's quickly go up here and right click on the lines layer. We're gonna select vectors there, right click and now we'll group those together. And there we have that. Let's have a quick look at what this is going to look like when we're all done. Let's hide the shading vectors. And that looks pretty neat. Let's create some really basic tooling for this because I know I'm running out of time. We're going to go ahead and show both the 2D and the 3D view. Okay, we are going to select this outside vector that we created before. Remember I said we were going to need this. This is what we're going to need. Now when I first did this, I thought that I wasn't going to actually cut this out. So what I did was I offsetted this vector about three millimeters outwards, that's the diameter of my tool, and that way it would look neat in a big chunk of material, whatever I happen to have kicking around. Ended up at the end that we use this to actually profile cut this piece out of the materials. But I'm gonna leave it there, so if you look at the files in the end, you don't know, be confused by why that's there. Let's close that down, look at our material setup. Everything looks great. You can see here that it's a very thin piece of relief at the top of our material. That's all great, we'll click OK. Now let's quickly do a roughing pass. I'm going to use that three millimeter end mill with the selected boundary. No boundary offset because I've already built that into this by using that offset. We're going to use Z-level roughing. No plunge moves. We'll just call this 3D roughing and we'll calculate that up really quick. Preview that visible tool path. Looks great. Low relief. Only one roughing pass. That's going to be very fast. Next thing we're going to do is use that same vector and we're going to do a finishing pass. We're going to use that three millimeter ball nose end mill, which in the end will, will add a, effectively another smoothing layer on this because you're using the round end of that. But that's okay. We're going to use that selected vector, no boundary offset. We're going to use a raster tooling and we are going to call this 3D finish. Blasting through this and we're going to calculate that up. Just take a few seconds for that. Then we're going to preview that visible tool path and that's what we're going to get in the end. Looks great, let's close that down. Let's go ahead and select these vectors here for our laser tool path. We're gonna use the laser cut and fill again. We're just gonna cut on those lines, same setup as before, it's the same laser, nothing has changed. We're gonna make sure that we project this onto our 3D relief, that's really super important. And we're gonna take that out of there and we'll calculate that. Preview our visible tool path, let's maximize that 3D view, and that's what we're gonna have in the end. And I think that looks pretty cool. So let's have a look at this in the labs. And I'm going to talk you through a couple things that I didn't show you here that we did in the end. So here I am setting up the machine again, using V transfer and zeroing my machine with that end mill in there. 
Took very little time to machine this. It was really quite fast. This is lovely white oak. It looks really great. And again, using the laser in this will really help to define that relief that you don't really see very well in the actual relief carving in the end. Along with it adds a very neat stylized look to this mountain range. We do a profile cut at the end of that roughing pass. Then we jump right into changing that bit to the ball nose and head on to the finishing pass. Looks really great and this um, end mill did a really nice clean job. It zipped along at a really good rate. And you can see that relief slowly starting to come out of the wood but again you're going to notice that in the middle of where those mountains come together the relief isn't all that substantial and also with the lighting here Anthony did a great job lighting it the relief looks really much more aggressive than it, what it really is this is going to finish up here in just a second and we'll finish up at the end you're just finishing up that tool path then we're going to pop in the laser tool path again with a zero off our machine. I dropped this down, um, not this pass, but for the next pass because I didn't show you this. I actually ran a laser tool path all around the outside of the actual mountain. And here we go. You can see that this pass works really good. And so when I did do that laser cut all around the outside, excuse me for being amazed by the bright laser. Um, I just projected it onto the modeling plane. So I had to drop my laser down the two and a half millimeters to make sure it's focused correctly on that plane. And this actually moves along pretty neat in the end. And here we go, we're gonna go on the outside with that. And that is gonna finish that off for us quite nicely. And I did run a profile cut around the edge of that um, just so I could cut it out of the material. It took a few passes to do that, but you'll see that in the end it looks really good. And because I did this, like originally I wasn't, didn't plan to do this, it becomes a nice little piece of decorative, stylized mountain range that you can have sitting around. So there you have those three projects. We have the Speed, the North Star, and the Mountain Range. And I'm considering this laser hybrid thing as a, what I would call precise machining or pre precise laser finishing in the end. I think that's great for somebody like me who really isn't great at doing the uh, finishing. I think that it really does help out a lot. So um, anyway, that's it for me here. Hope you took away a couple tips here and so on. Um, after me is gonna be uh, Sammy and Corey. They're gonna be showing you how to cut into plywood and some stuff about plastics. Really important stuff and good stuff if you plan on doing that. I'll be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. to show you how to model a Gorilla head, really basic modeling techniques are going to be able to give you this amazing gorilla head in the end. Anyway, that's it for me now. Kind of pressed for time. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope you're having fun. Keep making great stuff. And above all and everything else, I want you to keep safe, okay? We'll see you next time.